Hey folks, before we get started today, I want to take the time to make you aware of a very, very important event coming up November 16th. November 16th is the date of the JDRF One Walk in Plano. And as many of you know, uh, Abby, my youngest daughter, lives with type 1 diabetes. So JDRF is a very important organization for us. And I took the time to sit down with um, JDRF's uh, Tanya Konovalov to visit with her about the One Walk, as well as just some information on what it means to have type 1 diabetes, a little bit more uh, information for you, the listener, to understand just how critical the research that they do is. And so many of you have already supported Abby in her uh, fundraising for JDRF, and I could not be more grateful for that. But I wanted you to learn just a little bit more from one of JDRF's leaders, Tanya Konovalov. So please, before we get started with the regular conversation with Brady Smith, I wanted you to just take a moment to hear from Tanya and what's going on there and learn a little bit more about the November 16th One Walk in Plano. Thanks, folks. All right. Well, welcome to another episode of the Texas Titans podcast. I am here with my friend from JDRF, Tanya Konovalov. Tanya, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing well. I'm so glad that you are are here. You know, as most of my audience knows from a previous show, uh, I have a daughter, Abby, who lives with type 1 diabetes. And, uh, and it, you were one of the very first faces that we ever met from JDRF in Diabetes 101. And, uh, you have, and not only are you a leader at JDRF as far as, uh, doing outreach and development and, and basically just kind of introducing, uh, people like, Abby to this new life that they have just been diagnosed with. Uh, but you, you yourself live with type one diabetes. So, uh, I want to talk about you, your story and your role with JDRF, as well as just introducing the audience to what JDRF does and the great work that you guys are doing. And then I want to get into what's coming up November 16th with the one walk and talk about that so that anybody that's in the audience that wants to participate, which by the way, Tanya, I mentioned this to you last week, th this audience has been amazingly supportive, um, so far. So I want them to learn a little bit more as we get closer to approaching that date. So with that, let's, let's take it from there. It's all you. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to hear that uh, your audience is so supportive. That is just great to hear. Um, so JDRF is the leading international nonprofit organization fighting to cure type 1 diabetes and to improve lives of those uh, of people living with type 1. So I am the outreach manager in the uh, greater Dallas chapter. So that covers up to Oklahoma, over and inclusive of Tyler area, all the way to Louisiana, down to um, including Waco, about halfway to Fort Worth. So all that area is ours. And um, I actually, as I mentioned, I'm the outreach manager, and I have been living with type 1 diabetes since I was nine years old. So that's 43 years now. Right. Even Ooh. though I look like I'm 29, <laughs> Absolutely. I am a little bit older. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and it's just crazy how much things have changed since I was diagnosed. So when I was first diagnosed, it, um, well, let me back up a little bit. Type one diabetes means that my autoimmune attack system attacked my beta cells in my pancreas. They make a hormone called insulin and you have to have insulin to live. If I were before things were developed back in the twenties, um, people died with uh, type 1 diabetes. So insulin takes all the nutrients from food and distributes it to all the cells in my body to keep me alive, keep me growing, give me energy. So because I have type 1, I have to take insulin through another source that's either shots or through an insulin pump. And then to know how much insulin I have to take, I have to do sugar glucose test to know what my sugar level is, how much insulin to take based on how much food I'm about to eat, based on what time of day it is, based on if the moon is full, just every kind of um, possible element that happens in your day impacts blood sugar levels. So that's kind of in a nutshell uh, what living with type one is. So when I was first diagnosed, the only way I could tell what my sugar level was is to do a urine test. Mm -hmm. So mom would pull me in off the playground 
I would have to go to the bathroom and do this little chemistry set, uh, test how much sugar was in my urine, and then from that make decisions. Well, now we know that that's two or three hour old information. So it was not only gross, but it was inaccurate. Um, and now, of course, we have amazing um, devices that help me test my blood glucose level at home really fast and accurate. The device is tiny. I have uh, an insulin pump that helps me deliver insulin uh, continuously throughout the day rather than taking up to six shots a day like I was before. Um, we have so much knowledge about how to count carbohydrates in food and how that impacts impacts blood sugar level, um, how stress impacts blood sugar, just all this different, um, these different advancements. And every single major advancement that's happened with type 1 diabetes control and management for the last 50 years, JDRF has played a major role in. Right. So I'm really proud to be working with JDRF. Um, all of these devices and this technology and the um, research to uh, find out best ways to manage glucose, all of that has made my life living with it um, just tremendously improved. Well, and one of the things too, Tanya, that I, I think, and I was, you know, very naive about diabetes. I used to think that, well, because a lot of people don't know the difference between type one and type two. And so the first question that we, we would receive whenever Abby was diagnosed was, well, does it run in your family? Uh, or is it something that she ate? Or, you know, was there something? And really for you guys that, that have type one, it's just kind of just a bad, bad draw. I mean, really, there's nothing. I mean, yeah, there there is a slight correlation, right, to genetics, but really, it's not something that mom's a carrier, dad's a carrier, granddad had it. It has nothing to do with it. it. Has nothing to do with what you've eaten. It just you kind of get dealt this bad hand. And you know what I would like the audience to know. And like I told you, I'm going to have uh, Abby on to to talk about it herself as we get closer. Um, but it your life has changed forever. You don't get to just get up and run out of the house to go to the store real quick and and leave your insulin behind, right? I mean, it's a, it's a life changing right. event. It is absolutely, and it's twenty it's twenty four seven the rest of my life. So um, because of that, there are a lot of um, people who are impacted psychosocially as yeah. well, as you can imagine, especially children who are diagnosed with it. Um, they can become depressed, overwhelmed. Um, th there's a lot of um, bullying that can happen because, you know, kids. Um, so that's another area that JDRF is really focused on is helping people deal with the, um, the emotional side of living with this chronic disease and um, having to, to make decisions all day, every day. I heard a statistic recently, I have it written down here, that uh, people with type 1 di diabetes make 186 additional decisions every single day. I believe whether it. it's yeah, whether it's bringing you know sugar with them or um, how much insulin or should I eat that or uh, is that exercise going to make my blood sugar drop or you know just all day every day there's decisions and so along with that can come some severe um, psychosocial issues as well. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that really got me with Abby is just her, you know, not being able to j just have to think about it. it's constantly on her mind and on your mind all the time. It never it never leaves you. And also for for the listener out there to kind of understand what like Tanya said a child deals with. Is, you know, I had a friend, I guess it was about a year ago that uh, was one of Abby's classmates and he was out at the lake at a party. And he had decided to drink alcohol, which, you know, is pretty common amongst, you know, kids. They get out, they have fun. And he had, he had diabetes. And, you know, I, I spoke to his mom about it afterwards. And this was a rare occurrence for him. Uh, but she, her heart was broken because whenever she got to him and he had to go to the emergency room because his, his blood sugar spiked. I mean, so again, listener, if you have diabetes, you don't get to have a, you know, just relax with a glass of wine when you want to and those sorts of things. Or you can, but it's, it's dangerous. You shouldn't. And, uh, and he told his mom, 
I just wanted to be a normal kid. I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of this. I mean, it's exhausting. And, and I remember you told us and that there will come a time in every child or teen's life that they finally just get angry that they're not, that they don't have a normal life like other kids. And, you know, I remember with Abby, as she was going through the honeymoon phase, and again, for the listener, what honeymoon phase is, is where your pancreas is still producing just a small amount of insulin. So literally there are days where Abby would wake up and she would not want to voice it out loud. And I certainly wouldn't want to tell her, but you, but I knew in the back of her mind, she was thinking, Oh my goodness. What if there was a mistake? What if maybe I'm okay? Because all of a sudden you function. Well, then whenever your pancreas decides to produce a little bit of insulin, it's literally impossible to keep your numbers straight. And Abby finally, she broke down and it's the only time she ever really got frustrated. She said, I wish my pancreas would finally just stop working completely. So then I could control this better. You know, it's, it's and and that's one of the things that I think that a lot of people don't understand or just, and they shouldn't if they, if you don't deal with it every day, but that's why we want to bring awareness that if you know someone with diabetes and you, you know, just to kind of help you understand the parenting and the children involved, it is a frustrating thing for the child. And then as a parent, you're just left helpless, which is really tough. Absolutely. And you know, one thing that we haven't touched on is if uh, my or Abby or anybody with type one, if our blood sugars go up or down, how that feels. Oh. So if blood, blood sugar goes down, which means I either didn't eat enough or I took too much insulin or I exercised too much. Um, I tend to feel you know very shaky, um, sort of like if you're out exercising and you're running and all of a sudden you hit a wall yeah. and you're just like, I can't go anymore. I've got to, you know, have some orange juice or something. Same thing. That's low blood sugar. Um, but if it goes untreated, I can easily pass out. Yeah. Um, and if that goes untreated, you know, yeah. worst case scenario, coma and then death. Um, if blood sugar is too high, then I feel very lethargic. My vision gets blurry. I just don't want to get out of bed. I can't think straight. And over long periods of time, uh, elevated blood sugar leads to long-term complications, which are very serious. So I've had quite a few eye, eye um, surgeries. Um, I have quite a few friends that are adults with type one that have kidney, they're on kidney dialysis now. Um, I've actually had a uh, triple bypass because my heart is, that's one of the main things. So kidney, eyes, and heart are one of the main things that diabetes can impact. So it's not just um, trying to keep your, your numbers in control because that's the thing the doctor right. says. It's really, it really impacts every single day of someone's life with type one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, let's talk about, um, uh, the, the walk that's coming up because let's talk about some of the good things, because let me tell you something like when you were talking about as a child, what you had to deal with, with the, literally the peeing on a stick method. I, I mean, I think to myself, my gosh, and, and the numbers are so off. Like you said, from the time that you actually get the reading to the technological advances that have been made. And, and it's it's really interesting. And again, uh, a lot of the listeners to this podcast, because this is uh, one of my, my deals is health and fitness and nutrition. And so a lot of people that listen to this are into things like intermittent fasting, you know, keto diets, you know, just all the things that are, that are, that are happening now that we're learning about the biology of fitness and eating and diet. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Peter Atia, who is a guy that I, I listen to and I read a lot of his, uh, his work, uh, on fasting and insulin control, but he actually, he, he is not diabetic, but he wears a Dexcom and more and more people are wearing Dexcoms to monitor their, uh, their, their blood sugar constantly because, Again, to the listener, you have no idea if you haven't studied this or had to deal with it, the impact insulin has on your body. It's one of those things we just kind of take for granted, but it and just do this. The If you just scratch the surface on the research of how big of a part insulin plays in your body's life, it's incredible. And what JDRF is doing is helping to fund so much of the research that's making it to where Children and adults like Abby can monitor, can live with, can have a have have a you know a much better quality of life than they otherwise would have. And things like the JDR One Walk and the the great fundraising that you do, Tanya, are are making that happen. So, 
tell the listeners how they can help with the one walk, how they can get involved. And and if they, and if they just listen to this and go, wow, I had no idea, but I want to learn more. And this might be my charitable mission going forward. What are some things that they can do? Absolutely. So um, the one walk is JDRF's uh, main fundraiser uh, globally. So this is our opportunity every year to um, include all of the diagnosed families, you know, whether it's a $5 donation or a um, much larger donation. Uh, But it's going to be on November the 16th. We have about 8,000 people from North Texas that all come out and they're all there to support people with type 1 diabetes. So it's such a feel good day. It's just amazing. Um, and it's we've got bounce houses for kids and spray painting their hair and all kinds of fun stuff for the little ones. And then it's a 5K walk. Um, our goal here in the Dallas chapter is to raise a million dollars for uh, type 1 diabetes research. And um, if you would be interested in supporting or like to support the mission, uh, the URL is walk.jdrf.org slash Dallas. Now, I know um, you, Jason, have your own yes. team. They need and, to look for Team East Texas. Yes. So once you're on there, you can search for a team, look for Team East Texas <laughs> and help support Jason and Abby and their efforts to uh, support the mission. Yes, I'd be very grateful for that. And those of you who, whenever I made the announcement and I did the blog post about Abby a couple of weeks ago that uh, that chipped in and supported, I'm so grateful. For those of you who haven't, uh, I would be terribly grateful, as would Tanya, Abby, and everyone at JDRF and everyone that is living with this disease. So with that, well, Tanya, I think we've covered it. I, t- I can't tell you how grateful I am for you taking the time to introduce yourself to the audience. Like I said, and, and, and the listeners heard before, I want to use the Texas Titans podcast as a platform for not only bringing interesting uh, peak performers to, uh, to to them and introducing them to, 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 to those folks where they can maybe pick up some tips and tricks on how to be better entrepreneurs, better business people, better leaders. But I also want to use this podcast to get out things that I'm passionate about and any, any organization that I believe in, that I believe is doing good in the world. I want to use the, the Texas Titans podcast as a platform to get that message out. And so I really appreciate the work that you're doing at JDRF and and, and, and on behalf of my daughter and all the other folks out there that are, that are living with this. And thanks for taking the time today. Absolutely. I'm happy to help. And if anyone wants to know any more, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Tanya. Well, howdy, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Texas Titans podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I have a great show for you today. My friend, my fraternity brother, as it were. Brady Smith is my guest today, and Brady is, by all accounts, a Texas Titan. He is an actor. He is an author. He is an artist. He is an entrepreneur, and he's just an all-in-all great guy, and I really think you will enjoy listening to Brady's journey from Houston, Texas to Hollywood, where he has spent the better part of his career in the arts and entertainment industry. And like all of these stories that I like to bring to you, I don't want you to just understand the where they are now and kind of how they're maintaining success, but I like for you to hear the backstory of how my guests have made that journey, the obstacles they've overcome, those those incidences when they just wondered, will this ever pay off? Will I will my dream ever become a reality? And you get that in this interview with uh, with Brady. So I think you'll really enjoy that. Enjoy this. And uh, let me give you a little bit about Brady's bio. Brady Smith is a native Texan moved to Los Angeles without knowing a single person there. He eventually landed a series regular role on the pilot, according to Bex in 2005, a.k.a. Everything I Know About Men, directed by James Burroughs. He has appeared in numerous television shows, including White Collar, Castle, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, The Bridge, CSI Miami, CSI Cyber, Harry's Law, Bones, ER, Criminal Minds, and recurring roles on Happy Land, Hostages, and Parks and Recreation. His feature film credits include Jason Reitman directed Young Adult, Two Days in New York, with uh, let's see, with. 
Julie Delpy and Chris Rock and Meet My Valentine, which he has a story by credit and stars alongside Scott Wolf. Brady is a past student of Playhouse West, the renowned acting studio founded by Robert Carnegie and Jeff Goldblum, and based on the teaching of Sanford Meisner. In addition to acting, he enjoys surfing, painting, raising chickens, and is an avid shark diver. He currently resides in L.A. with his wife, Tiffany Thiessen, and their two children. If ever there were, a, look, folks, we, we, we hear about these quote-unquote L.A. types, the Hollywood types, or whatever. What I love about Brady is the same guy that I met as an undergrad at Stephen F. Austin State University back in 1994 is the exact same guy that is out there in the mystical land of Hollywood in L.A. with his wife, Tiffany. And they they raise chickens, uh, as Brady discussed. They've got an acre of land out there where they raise chickens. They raise two beautiful children and have, by all accounts, a seemingly normal life in a really abnormal town. And I really think you'll enjoy this conversation. I'm so grateful for Brady taking the time. And I want to mention right here, we'll mention it in the the interview, look for Brady's children's book that he wrote with Tiffany. Brady did the illustration and also co-authored with Tiffany, You're Missing It. It is an incredible children's book and you can find it on amazon.com or if you happen to be in the east texas area you can go by hot tots as you know my favorite children's store on planet earth or any other planet so please come by hot tots pick up a copy of you're missing it it's fantastic the reviews are great it has done well and my next guest brady smith co-authored it with his wife tiffany Please, folks, enjoy the interview. Enjoy this conversation with Brady Smith. Thanks, folks. Brady Smith, how are you, my brother? I am good, my brother. How are you? (laughs) I'm doing well. I can't tell you how grateful I am for you taking the time out there on the West Coast. And uh, it's been so long since we caught up. I mean, this is weird because... I know you so well. I've known you since college. We're uh, we're fraternity brothers, and you were one of the uh, the guys that kind of took me under his wing, kind of an unofficial big brother. As a matter of fact, I wanted you to be my big brother, but you were you were heading out, and so uh, I did all right though. Robbie Chavez was uh, was Chavez. my big brother instead. I haven't heard that name in a long time. That's right. That's right. Uh, so. Now it's time to catch up. You're out and uh, you're out on the West Coast, and yep. you've been acting now. You've been a, a working actor for gosh, going on two decades, I guess. Almost. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Isn't that crazy? It seemed like yeah. It, <clears throat> Los Angeles has a way, or maybe it's just Southern California, just making the time go by super fast. <laughs> right. It does not feel like I've been out here that long. But then again, I still feel like I'm 21, so I guess that you know. I'm the same way, man. I think that we need to, and I'm going to keep that going as long as I can. Yeah, I think that's a good, I had this theory why old people tend to be grumpy at times is because they don't feel like they're old. Yeah. You know? and your <laughs> old probably feels like he's 21 years old still. I think I, that's, I think there's a lot of merit to that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brother. All right. Here's where I want to go with this, because let me tell you something, you know, we've talked a little bit offline about, you know, just, um, Entrepreneurship, which by all accounts, you have been a very successful entrepreneur at, you know, practicing your art all the way back from your days in Houston as a a freelance artist, a commercial artist, and then heading out to L.A. And like I told you whenever I asked you to do this interview, you know, Brady, I have watched you from the beginning. I mean, it's not like Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches, Texas is producing a lot of artists and actors that end up in LA and being able to make a solid living at it. And you're one of those people that by sheer will, grit, hard work, and taking some chances and some risks, you pulled it off. And I, and I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm so proud of you. It's been so fun to watch your career from afar. And so now um, I just want you to kind of tell the story about you. Uh, let's just start. You graduate from SFA with yep. an art major, right? If yep. I remember correctly, BFA in art, yeah, yep, and then you go to uh, Houston, and then boom, take us from there. Uh, went back home, college graduate, had to move in with my mom and dad. Started working freelance for just a little bit at the Houston Chronicle, just to make ends meet. Yep, and I did that for about ten months, and then uh, 
brother of ours, Jim Caldwell and I, we went to uh, Europe for six months and it was an amazing trip, but we were so poor. We would, we would go to McDonald's and get, you know, ketchup and lettuce. I mean, ketchup and mustard packages and eat those because we were, we were borderline starving. Uh, did that for six months, started doing my journals. I started doing these illustrated journals. My dad gave me one right when I got on the plane. I had never kept a journal in my life. He's like, you're going to get bored, draw something that's funny. In 20 years, you'll, you'll never remember what you're doing right now. And I took that to heart and I still do a daily journal to this day. I mean, for going on 19 years now. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, my marriage, the moment I met my wife, the moment our children were born up until doing this podcast with you right now at one twenty four in the PM on Pacific standard <laughs> time. So, uh, <clears throat> worked at the Houston Chronicle, felt like I, I wanted to give, uh, acting a shot. I felt like I had kind of plateaued in Houston uh, as far as having art shows there. I did some plays there at an awesome theater company called Stages. And then I, Jason, I just threw a Hail Mary. I didn't know anybody. I just loaded up my truck. My dad was like, you've worked for seven years trying to get your art up and going. And I was like, I know. And it'll be here when I get back. And he was like, Godspeed, you know. Moved out here. This is all very much Cliff Notes, by the way. Uh, moved out here. Had to get three jobs. I worked at a dive shop where I was cleaning people's uh, urine-filled wetsuits from their weekend Catalina, Catalina dive trips. That was that was awesome. Yeah, to do. I bet. Yeah, uh, delivered food and uh, worked as a. You'll get a kick out of this. A substitute teacher, where I was having to pretend that I knew what calculus was. <laughs> that would have been, re- that would have required oh, an Academy Award winning performance out of me. <laughs> it was, it was Oscar worthy to say the <laughs> least. But, uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I ended up, uh, start, I started studying acting at a place called Playhouse West where they did the, uh, Sanford Meisner technique, which is just really, basic listening and responding, which in my opinion is just what acting is anyway. It's you come from a certain perspective, you know, your lines, you say your lines, you mean your lines, right? That's acting. Um, and then I ended up getting a manager who sent me out on a few auditions. I wanted to know what I was doing. So I wasn't wasting anybody's time. So I studied for about three years before I started auditioning. Uh, and then started slowly getting work. You know, the, the, the chronological order is basically you start getting co-star work, which is five lines or less on a TV show. Okay. Guest star where the part gets bigger, recurring, series regular, and then you move into film and stuff. So started out doing that, uh, doing commercials as well. Right. Which, funny enough, the commercials, at least in my experience, have – Paid way more than movie roles. Yeah, yeah. Just because the residuals. Yeah. But uh, yeah, my first guest star, I got set up on a blind date with my wife, and it was the last first date either of us have had. That's so awesome. it's, been, it's been together. Oh my goodness, sixteen years. Well, you know, one of the things cool, you know, Brady, that I wanted to tell you while I had you on the the show today was you and 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 for the. For the uh, listener that doesn't know, you're married to Tiffany Amber Thiessen. Um, yep. You know, uh, probably her most notable role is uh, you know Kelly Kapowski. That's where it all kind of started. My favorite role happens to be though. Uh, well, the, my favorite movie she was in was Son in Law. I, I love that movie. It's just a, yeah. it's, anyway. But uh, you guys have seemingly maintained a very very normal, healthy. Uh, family centric relationship. You know, I, I remember from the first time, and it is it is a bit surreal, Brady Smith, to open up a copy of Us magazine and see a photo layout of one of your fraternity brothers' weddings. That was kind of cool. You know, you gave all, yeah. you gave a lot of us a, a, some bragging rights. You know, hey, I know that guy. No, I really know him. He he knows my name. Um, but and yeah, you know, so I want to talk a little. I want to go back to some of the stuff that you touched on, kind of in the journey. But while we're at it. 
because you and Tiffany do have, you got two beautiful daughters and you've got just a, um, well, just, a daughter and son, a daughter yeah. and son. That's right. That's right. I forgot you had, I have, I have the two girls. And so yep. I, I get that on the brain. You guys had the most beautiful little family and seemed very normal. I mean, and I like when, even whenever you've appeared on Tiffany's kitchen where, you know, cause obviously she loves to cook. Yep. Um, how do you maintain a sense of groundedness uh, out there where it's almost like an alternate universe. And tell us a little bit about what life is like out on the West coast in, in the uh, entertainment industry. Okay. Uh, I'll take the, as far as keeping things grounded, I mean, a few things. One, I had never personally seen saved by the bell or 90210. It wasn't a, uh, a conscious decision. It's just, yeah. it was my speed of, uh, television viewing, I guess at the time. Right. So I knew who my wife was when we went out on a date, but I had never seen any of the shows. Um, and I think from the very first time I met my wife, it was very clear to me that her priorities were not the entertainment industry. Her priorities were family and, uh, friends. Right. And, right. and she, she had been, you know, she's been in this business since she was probably eight years old. I mean, so it's just kind of what she did and she was very blessed to be doing it for as long as she has been, but that's not her priority. Her prior, her priority now is her children, children and her family. So that to me is what keeps everything grounded because neither of us really get, you know, we, we, live in Los Angeles, but not LA proper. I mean, we have an acre of land. We have seven chickens. We have three dogs. I mean, we keep it all real, if yeah. you will. And you uh, and your boy, uh, you and your boy share a love of star Wars, which is very apparent, which by the way, we're going to Disneyland tomorrow. Oh. I'm going to see galaxy's edge for the first time. I probably won't be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> having a, best. having a boy has been for for me, I, I'm reliving all the stuff that I had when I was a kid, right? That's exactly like my parents, what my brother says, yeah. It's so fun, and my wife makes so much fun of me. She's like, you are a nerd, and <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that, but my parents saved a bunch of these Star Wars action figures and mailed them to me, and I'm playing, I'm playing with awesome. them with my son. It's just a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I neither, neither of us really – our focus and our attention goes to our loved ones, I guess. That's probably the best way to put it. I mean, the entertainment industry is a, I mean, it can be a beast and you can easily get sucked into all of the um, insecurities that come along with it, you know, but we just try to focus on the stuff that's important, which right. is not the entertainment industry. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just, it's, you know, when you're blessed enough to work in it, it's a lot of fun. And I love going to set. I love, I, I love being there and learning and watching and playing and it's collaborative and it's exciting. But when you, you come home, you're home and it's, that's what it's all about to me. I hope I answered your questions. Yeah. In this no, roundabout it's, way. it's fantastic. It's the answer that I expected because it does, it comes through and, and eventually, and I want to catch back up to that when we talk about, the, the book that you've written, and it, I know you guys collaborated on that, oh, but but let's go back. Oh, there it is. You're missing it. Right yes. It's sitting yes. here at the desk? That's so weird. It just happened to be there. Wow. You know, you haven't learned a thing about product placement in your time. Not at all, that dude. That's, <laughs> just wow. That <laughs> yeah. um, but I want to go back before we get there to as you're coming up, and you're kind of, there's – when did you – First of all, how do you handle the rejection that is inevitable for any, from what I understand, unless you've got just some uber super connection out in LA, which you did not. Again, I cannot stress to the listener enough. My friend Brady Smith is that guy that showed up from Texas off the bus with a load of talent, a lot of ambition, and no contacts, just said, here I am, and, and worked your ass off to be where you are. And I, I, I want to stress that because... This podcast is for entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, folks that want to start businesses. I don't care if it's an entertainment. I don't care if it's a broom factory. The the a lot of the disciplines and the practices are the same. And when you went out there and you and you would go to audition after audition, you're working three jobs and you would get rejected. 
how did you overcome that? How did you handle that? What was your mental state? And did you ever think for one minute of giving up on that dream? Wow. Uh, I think I keep coming back to ignorance is bliss. Mm -hmm. And I say that because maybe if I knew how challenging it could be at times, maybe I would have never driven out here in the first place. Maybe I still would have. I don't know. Um, as far as rejection is concerned, you know, I, I don't know the exact figures, but I believe out of every, every person that holds a Screen Actors Guild card, SAG, which is the Screen Actors Guild, the union for acting, I want to say that for everybody who holds one of those cards and pays money, pays dues in the union, less than 2% make their living as actors. And that that 2% includes the Tom Hanks, the Meryl Streeps. Wow. Down to me. So uh, there is a lot of rejection. However, you know, all I can control, Jason, and, and we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, is what I can control. Right. You know, I can go into the room. I can be as prepared as humanly possible, know my stuff, do the audition. And then I just have to, that's where I have to find peace and say, I just did my best. And <clears throat> it's not, it's not easy at times because I think like any, uh, like anybody, if you work hard for something and you put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it, you, you want it, you want it to go your way. I, I always say, you know, if you study medicine, and you don't give up, you'll eventually become a doctor. If you study law, you don't give up, you'll be a lawyer. And on and on and on. If you study acting and you don't give up, you still might not ever be an actor. Wow. It's, yeah. it's just kind of the way it is. Yeah. Um, I will say that I'm very grateful that I have my art because it's something that I've, I, I just – it's like oxygen for me. I, I, I've never not done it. And it's a good way to, uh, take my mind off. Like, why haven't I had an audition this week? Or geez, I thought I was going to book that, you know? I mean, I think in the last, since we spoke about a week ago, I've had four auditions mm -hmm. and this doesn't, I'm not trying to make this sound like I'm tooting my horn or cocky or anything, but and if it was any other way, then there's really no reason to do it. What, I, what I'm about to say is this. Each audition I left, they were all for – one was for a film and three for TV shows. Good roles. A lot of material to, to learn. And each room, each time I left that room, I was like, I think I got it. <laughs> right. I got it. And then crickets. Wow. Literally, it's – the analogy I use uh, talking to my wife about it sometimes, I, was, I, I say <clears throat> it's the craziest thing. If you paint a painting, you have that painting. If you do a drawing, you have that drawing on a sheet of paper. With acting, you learn this material, but ultimately it's just words, right? So when you leave the room, all that work that you put into it yeah. literally vaporizes. Yeah. It's just like right, right. gone. So – Jason, is that ever easy? No. However, I've been doing it for so long now that I get home and we have young kids and the day continues and and that's just kind of the way it is. You know, it's there's an expression I, I like to repeat, which is onward and upward. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it's meant my wife's actually been incredibly helpful with all this. She she gave me a note when we were still dating because you know I it, I was still very new at it and I'd have all the I'd have the <clears throat> the paper in my hand when I got home from the audition and she's like why do you still have the audition material and I'm like well because I could have done this maybe I should have said that she's like always find the nearest trash can and throw that away when you leave the room wow that way you don't just go over it and over it over it for no reason which yeah. is was a great note for me, and I I've done that ever since, man. I I have my stuff. I see a trash can, two <laughs> points, and I'm out the door. Yeah, yeah. And it's something very freeing about that. But yeah, I don't know if it, Jason. I I don't know if it ever gets 
easy because if, if you care about something and you want to do it and be really good at it when it doesn't go your way, like anything in life, it, it stings, yeah. you know, yeah. but I think the important thing is just always showing up and always never giving up. Well, and you know, you, you remind me of one of my favorite quotes from Nietzsche is that if the, if the why is big enough, the how will usually appear. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things that, that, and that I'm, that's why I wanted to drill down on this is, I, and I'm so interested in it because a lot of people, I mean, look, out here in the uh, the non entertainment world, people show up for jobs maybe once every three to five years. But like you said, you're showing up for a job, you know, over and over. And it is the proverbial "Don't call us, we'll call you." It's it's like you oh, you yeah. go in feeling like you know you really crush something, and then they don't even have the courtesy or or the time or the or the vested interest in calling and saying, "Hey Brady, well done. You you really nailed it. We're just you know you're a brown headed guy, and we need a we need a a blonde headed guy. He's a surfer, you know, who knows? Um, yeah, there's definitely none of that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, there, um, so there. I think that's, that's very admirable. Now tell me when it was that you realized and, and okay, two things, how long did it take? And when was it that you realized I am now a working actor and, and, did you even realize it or did all of a sudden you look up and you looked at the calendar and you had three jobs and knew that you were going to be able to pay the rent doing nothing but act, you know, kind of what did that look like? I remember. So before, before Tiff and I were married and now obviously we share a business manager, but before I had a business manager, I would always have residual checks and residuals are, uh, in layman terms, you know, you just kind of, you do the, you get paid to do the job on the day. And then once they start to air on television, what you shot, which can be a month, a year, when two weeks later, you start to get residuals in the mail. So I got these, I got these checks in the mail at this apartment I was living in. And funny enough, Barkley Walker and Brian Copeland were in town. Oh, really? This, yeah which is a whole nother story, but I'll tell you about that in a second. <laughs> um, and I remember going to my PO box and I opened it up and there was like three checks and I opened those up and I was like, okay, <laughs> daddy doesn't have to clean urine filled wetsuits anymore. <laughs> so that was when I, when I, I think I realized when I had this, when I could stop doing the other stuff, Yeah, that's when I was like, okay, I'm making my living doing it. Yeah. And, uh, and I get questions, you know, <clears throat> my mom and dad are so supportive. They always have been, yeah. but they've taken this journey with me where there's been so many close calls to jobs that would really change my life sure. forever. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and another analogy I use is like, you know, that feeling Christmas morning when you're a kid and you come down and there's all the presents under the tree like imagine being so close to opening one of those presents. Right. You have your hand on the paper. Yeah. And then somebody just walks by and goes, shoink. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. So that type of close kind of yeah. you know, calls. But my my mom and dad having taken this journey with me, I mean, you know, there's there's peaks and valleys, and that's with anything in life, but when you get really close to something and it doesn't happen, it, it stings that much more. And my dad asked me this question one time where he was like, When do you think and he didn't mean it in a in a bad way at all. He meant it in a in a just a concerned father way, you know. Uh, but he's like, when are when when do you think you're gonna make it? You know, when are when are you gonna make it? <laughs> yeah. And I thought about that, and I was like, you know, Dad, when I moved out here, I didn't know anybody. All I wanted to do was get a a acting job, just get a job, yeah. and. I feel like having made my living doing it solely as an actor for, like you said, almost two decades, that's making it. Amen, my, brother. Amen. There's different levels yeah. of making it, but my wife and I have a comfortable life and we're happy. And that also in itself, even more so, is yeah. making it. I feel like I made it when I met my wife and 
not and it has nothing to do with her being in the business that she was in, but just having met someone, falling in love, getting married, and having kids. I mean that that's making it. Yeah, to, Man, you know. and God, it's so it's so well said, Brady. And I told you about the uh, the the book that I have that's. Uh, that literally it's, it's on Amazon now. It just came out that, and that's exactly what I talk about because when I was 28 in the business world, I realized I would, I would be happier making 40 K a year as an entrepreneur struggling Mm -hmm. to get by and to create the check than comfortably making 400 K a year doing something I can't stand. And, you know, I think people get so conditioned to believe that, you're supposed to just follow this road, follow these steps. And one of the things that I and, and know this and this is not pandering just because you've been a successful commercial actor as well as film, but I know that you know you've done really well with the national commercials. I as an entrepreneur and someone who gets that and who I, I've started to call it life curation. I, I it's someone who takes the the steps and the courage to curate the life that they want to lead. Um, I look at these recurring commercial actors of which you're one and there's certain people I go, that's phenomenal there. You know, that's a life there you know, and, and God bless them. There's nothing, please. There's nothing against plumbers. That's a noble trade and they make up, they make a fantastic living. But uh, I just heard Julian Edelman uh, talking, telling his story about the first time he ever had a conversation with Bill Belichick and that he kept bumping into him at their, uh, their training facility. They were there late, late, late at night. And finally, they're leaving, and Belichick's just one of those guys. I mean, it's Julian Edelman. I mean, he's one of the star players, right? He's he's right. Brady's go-to guy. They never speak. You don't speak to Belichick. You just, unless I guess you're Tom Brady, you really don't have that relationship. So he's he said that finally at the end of the night, they're both walking out at the same time, and he's like right behind Belichick, and he's like, I don't know what to say. And finally, he's like, wow, coach, I mean, I can't believe this hour you're still here. And he said Belichick just turns around to him and goes, it beats being a plumber and just walked out, you know, and Edelman was kind of like scratching his head. Even in the interview, he's like going, I don't really know what the heck he meant, but I took that is that Belichick understands he gets to make his living doing what he loves. And right. someone in your field uh, that I, I wrote about in my book, Jerry Seinfeld, whenever he was offered $5 million an episode to continue on with his show, he told Katie Couric, he said, what do I need more money for? All I ever wanted to do was make a living doing my comedy. And he said, I've been doing that since I was selling umbrellas on the street during the day and working my gig at night at the clubs. And right. so to hear you say that, man, that's, that's why I have you on this podcast. It's not the, the glamor of you being in LA as an actor and, you know, and going to red carpets. It's the fact that you have pursued a life of your own curation where you've been able to do your art. You're doing things that most others would only dream of because you're living life on your terms. So well done, sir. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And back at you. Well, I appreciate appreciate, different locations. Well, you know, and that's, uh, and you and I have talked through the years, you know, there's, there's times I thought about just cashing it all in. I I called you up one day. It's like, Brady, I'm coming to LA. You know, I've got a screenplay, you know, I've got, I've got all these things that, uh, and now, you know, slowly, but surely, uh, there's some things that, you know, I would like to do in that space and, and we'll see. But at the end of the day, you know, I always tell people if, if you, I have done a masterful job of not having a real job for 20 years, like I told you before we came on. And, yeah. and when it's, when anything starts to feel like a real job, then I know I'm probably in the wrong place. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and so that's kind of my mantra. And I think you've done that really well. So, all right, now let's get back to the timeline. So, you st- and by the way, the first commercial, first national spot I ever saw you, and I don't know if it was the first one, was the uh, Dr. Scholl's, that you were right. so gelling, you were mo-gelling. And, uh, and that's just, you know, again, it's kind of a surreal thing whenever you're watching a national television show, and there's Brady. It was so yeah, cool. That was, I think that was my second commercial, maybe possibly third, but... Man, that thing had a life of its own. It, it was, I remember, here's a very quick story. Actually, Kevin Sullivan was was out here visiting when this happened. All these <laughs> all these guys. Are, just, there's like bad pennies. They just keep turning up, these guys. So, you know, here, I got to tell you this because you'll appreciate this real quick. We love our friends. Absolutely. Right? We do. We love our friends. Yeah. We love our, 
fraternity brothers. When I was out here for three years before my beautiful wife and I started dating, yeah. our friends, and I say our plural, <laughs> might have visited me once every nine, 11 months. When Tiff and I started dating, <laughs> these sons of bitches were out every weekend. Go every figure. weekend. They're like, we're coming back out. I'm like, you guys are so transparent, man. They're like, well, now you do cool stuff. I'm like, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, back to the story uh, with the Dr. Schultz thing. I, I remember Kevin and my wife and I, this is before we had kids, we were at Coffee Bean waiting on our drinks. And there was, God bless them, this, you know, 21 year old kid who was probably up all night or had been dabbling in certain substances that morning. And he dropped off the, the drink as we were waiting to get our coffee. And he gave one to my wife and he looks at her and he goes, huh, awesome. <laughs> and then Tiff walks away and then he calls my name and I come up and get it. And he sees me and he goes, what? Whoa, dude, you're the gel, dude. And Kevin's like, what does it matter with this world, man? You're, awesome. like, you got bigger. I love it. Cred, or it just, it was so silly, but. You're the gel, dude. Yeah. <clears throat> that and the, I did a dog food commercial. Yes, I remember the dog. It was Bentiful or something. I can't remember. Bentiful. Bentiful. Well there, done. Yeah. Hey, bro, let me tell you something. Okay, here, your, your, your brother Jason that that has not been to see you out in LA knows. And I didn't, and look, here's the way I, I, I approach these interviews. I try to keep them as, as unscripted as possible. It's a conversation, but man, I know sure. Beneful. I know you, you have portrayed an armadillo in a capital one commercial. I remember our, our you, kids saw that for the first time about two weeks ago. It was fantastic. A little so creepy, fun. but great. Uh, little. You fell off a ladder for Aflac. I did. Yes. Yes. Done, yeah. yeah. So look, if, if, if you show up now, maybe it just shows I used to watch way too much television. There could be that, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I took note whenever you were making an appearance. And so that, uh, that to me is, is, is pretty, pretty cool that, yeah, you're known as the gelling guy. The, the kid gets excited about that. It was, yeah, that it's the beneficial. I'm trying to remember there was a line I said, and for years, our buddies wouldn't even say anything. They would just leave a voicemail and say that <laughs> line. Yeah. Oh, it was, uh, I'm talking to the dog. I'm holding up Beneful and then some other dog food. And I'm like, decisions, decisions. <laughs> That's right. So all of our buddies would be like, decisions, decisions. And then click. <laughs> so there was a lot of, <sighs> uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of fun. I love uh, it. Well, you know, the, the um, this was this was kind of neat. So, I I did a very small part on a movie called First Man about uh, Neil Armstrong mm -hmm. last year. Ryan Gosling played Neil Armstrong. Damien Chazelle directed it, hot off uh, winning the Oscar for La La Land. Yep. And I got I got this uh, a friend of mine. She was in my acting class, and I hadn't talked talk to her in 15 years probably, maybe 12. But she texted me, and she goes, hey, I have a buddy who's casting uh, First Man. Would you he, – he asked about you. Would you read for it? And I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> Why is that even a question? Right. You know? So the guy texted me, and he goes, so listen uh, – we're just put we're, each of the actors are putting themselves on tape and then I'm sending it straight to Damien, who's in Georgia right now prepping the film. Uh, so I put myself on tape. It was a very, very simple scene. I played a, a real uh, friend of Neil Armstrong's named um, Butch, who was, he was a uh, pilot with. OK. And I uh, put myself on tape and. A lot of the times when you do this, like I said, if it doesn't just vaporize as soon as you send it away, it'll take a long time, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I think like a day later he calls and he's like, Damien loves you. Uh, these are the dates. Uh, congratulations. I'll give you more uh, input later. I'm like, what? What? Huh? I ended up doing the movie um, <clears throat> and it was awesome. 
And the two things that I took from this, being on that size of a production, Mm -hmm. which was bigger than anything I'd ever done, you know. Um, And also, every one of the scenes I was in uh, was with uh, Ryan Gosling. Yeah. So definitely the biggest, quote, star I'd ever worked with directly. Right. And the one thing I took from it, Jason, is, you know, I think that so much of well, everything that you make a big deal is always really just here, right? That's yeah. all it is. I mean, yeah. as long as you're healthy and your family's good, I think that's what counts. That's what mat- what matters. But sometimes in situations, you make things bigger than they need to be. And I was doing this when I was on set with First Man right before the first take. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah. Brady, you good? I'm like, I'm good. Yeah. And I had to take a second and be like, <laughs> wow. All right. We're doing this. Yeah. And then they build action. I went in, I did the scene. And after the scene was over, I walked back to where, you know, cause they shoot the scenes over and over and over. I walked back and it was just the first one. So that's where I, the nerves were. And I was like, that was nothing. Yeah. Like there, these are just two guys that happen to have been, not that they're not talented because they are, they're incredibly talented. Yeah. But they've also just been a lot luckier than me. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. A lot luckier than me. Yeah. Ryan, for as good as he is, he's just saying lines. Yeah. He's present in the moment. He's made it personal. And when you are on a set, that's what you do. Yeah. Nobody's doing anything different than the other guy. Yeah. And for me, as an artist, that was really welcoming to to be at that level and see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was awesome. Cut two, <laughs> and this is the old uh, side hook of the entertainment business. Um, movie comes out, and out of the three f- scenes that I shot, one made the cut, and out of all the dialogue in that one scene, I might have said four seconds of dialogue. Oh, yeah. After being there for two weeks. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I remember uh, the movie came out. I was pumped to see it, obviously. And then a buddy of mine was like, yeah, dude, that was a good, that was a good scene you're in. I'm like, sweet, wait, what? One scene? And he goes, oh, yeah. Oh, did you shoot more? And I'm like, yeah, I shot, I shot some more. <laughs> and I ended up watching it when Tiff and I, when we did our book tour for the children's book, almost a year later, we were on a plane, uh, going to New York to do the, uh, tour. And it was one of the films on the plane and I watched it and, uh, it was, you know, David Frost actually, yeah, he was like, dude, it was awesome. And, and me being me, I'm like, eh, you know, yeah, it was cool, but I right. did so much more. And David's like, Hey man, you're in a freaking movie. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Then it all comes back to where you're like, you know what? It is good. Absolutely. So thank you, David Frost, for that reality check. But <laughs> well, yeah. well, it's so true. And that's the thing that it, that is cool. Now, you did mention something there. That, I mean, that's got to be frustrating in and of itself because uh, Luke Coffey, who I told you I interviewed for the last podcast. And, uh, that's a good yeah, name, man. That's a strong name. Isn't that great? It Luke. is great. Luke Coffey. Uh, it's, he told me the same thing. And anybody that's been in entertainment that I've talked to, they say that, that you know, luck does have so much to do with it. So, that's, so there's two, two questions here. One, how frustrating is that? It, but two, do you ever really lose that sense of wonder? I mean, that's one of the things I asked Luke. Like the first time he walked up to uh, uh, the lot that he was going to be working on for for Vegas, I was like, you know, for those of us out here again that will never set foot on a on, on a studio lot, do you ever just go, eh, or is it still just like, wow? Are you kidding me? It's still like, wow. That's awesome. Absolutely. You know. Look, man, I'm easily impressed, Jason. We've had chickens for seven years, and every every day I get eggs, and I still, when I open up that egg hutch, I'm like, "What? <laughs> right. Another one? Yeah. This is awesome." <laughs> so I'm easily impressed. Uh, 
however, no, man. It, I feel like if it if if it loses its sense of wonder, then what's the point? I, uh, it, it, you know, I just, I just, my my wife was on a show called Alexa and Katie on Netflix, uh, four seasons, and I ended up doing six of the last few episodes. And Tiff and I never worked together. Um, and that was fun. And that, I mean, and I'm only using that as an example because it's the last job I had. It was just, I think a month ago we wrapped, but you know, I'm not going to be specific, but there were other people on the show and they were, uh, there was a tendency to bitch and moan sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you, you are doing exactly what you set out to do. Yeah. You're getting paid a pretty penny for it. Yeah. And there are people who would, you know, they would do anything to be yeah. where you are. Yeah. So that also, it's just not lost on me. Every, awesome. every job I get, every time I'm, I am grateful enough to get paid to act, to act. Yeah. I'm, I'm as happy as a clam, you know, yeah. there are situations where I've done TV shows where people are, and, and I'm not talking about this past show because I was just, you know, minor little uh, blah, blah. I had to get here early, which is like, come on, <laughs> right? you know, but I've been on shows where the, uh, the people, the actors are miserable and treat people horribly. Yeah. And that takes like everything in my being, Maybe it's, you know, the Texas. Absolutely. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> where, where you're like, wow, that guy needs, he, he, he needs to be reminded. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot of ungrateful people, but I guess that's like in any business. Um, I just think that it's a little bit more obvious when it's, when you're, doing a job that you should consider yourself so incredibly lucky to be doing, you know, but there are, like I said, less than 2% of card holding SAG members make their living doing it. Which is just a remarkable statistic that I didn't know. Yeah. That's amazing. And in in Southern California, brother, $30,000 does not go very far. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, so, and I'm going to be – this is so cool. It's very timely because um, Gina Small, who runs the career success uh, department at our alma mater, Stephen F. Austin State University, she has me come speak at least once or twice a year to the students. And, you know, it's interesting. And I remember what it was like at, you know, 20, you know, 21. And you want everything and you want it now. And one of the things that I think that you've deployed very, very well is patience and persistence in, in what you want to do. And then still – and, you know, at this point in your career, the gratitude that you're still able to show, I mean, just from a philosophical standpoint, Brady, you know, for, for what, what, what words of wisdom, because I'm going to quote you, would you have for those? Because there are some of those students that actually listen to the podcast who want to do great things. I mean, you know, what, what do you do to keep your mind right? What do you do to stay physically in the game? What do you do to just keep things in perspective on a daily basis? Do you meditate? Does it, is it just a taking time to reflect and have moments of gratitude? I mean, what, what is the, what are your practices off screen and behind the scenes when nobody's looking that keep you focused and having that attitude that you have? Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate you asking that question. And in, in all honesty, I don't know if I'm the, the best at that. I mean, my, my wife is really good at it. Um, I, you know, I have to remind myself that it's a sprint. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Yeah. That's, I say that to myself probably daily. And then I also have to remind myself that I have my health, my family's healthy and that is what's important. And then everything else is just kind of like a cherry on top, right, you know? Right. So for me, that's what I do. I, I don't, I just try not to get focused on, you know, the end goal. And I try to find joy in the journey. That's so huge. That's huge. That, that, now granted, Jason, I say that I, I'm not 
awesome at it, you know? Right. I think that one of the reasons I've never quit is that I'm incredibly stubborn and bullheaded at times. Yeah. And I also don't know what the heck else I would do. Right. I mean, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I can't say, you know what? I gave this a go, <laughs> right. move back and do whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I try, I try every day I wake up and, and try to be appreciative of what I have, which is again, really everything, right. my family and our health. Cause if you don't have the health buddy, you have nada. Yeah. Um, and I also, you know, uh, I, I say prayers. I pray every day. Yeah. Yeah. I say prayers with our kids. I say prayers of thanks for what we have. Um, and I try to constantly remind myself that, you know, it's, it's, it's just work, man. Yeah. You know, if I'm lucky enough to do it, then I feel lucky enough to do it. Um, the art has been a unsuspected uh, kind of step stool that I've leaned on when um, when acting doesn't kind of like if a job that I go out for doesn't go my way, I can always paint. Yep. You know, I have a few more books that I just got greenlit, which is which is um, exciting and overwhelming and everything. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's it, man. Or I'll. If I get frustrated, I'll go sit on the bench in our chicken coop, <laughs> watch those things for a little bit. And that's it, man. You know, it's, it's almost like, I feel like with, and I, and I'm sure you feel the same way, but with children, you don't really have the luxury anymore to be a complete, um, self-absorbed jackass. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you don't because, yeah. you know, now everything that I do, everything my wife does, 99% of our conversations are about them. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And when I look at work now, it's not necessarily for me to continue to go up the, whatever, you know, imaginary ladder that is that we kind of make in our heads, but it's, it's all about income to provide financially and be comfortable and, and put money away for them. So, well, and let's here's here's another thing I want to talk about because this is one of the things that's cool. So you know, um, when Jimlin and I got married, a lot, everyone around Tyler loves Jimlin. She owns a beautiful children's boutique. It's it's the place in Tyler, and uh, and so whenever we were getting married, all I heard was how wonderful Jimlin was, how great Jimlin was, and so you know it was it was funny. So in in our relationship you know, like kind of what you deal with, you know, I, I, it's, it's funny. Uh, someone actually, you, you want signed on to something as, uh, uh, Mr. Brady Thiessen, you know, and I thought that was hilarious. I one time was called Mr. McKee. So I can relate uh, from that perspective. Yeah. So she had her business whenever I came in, um, uh, <coughs> Tiff had her acting career. You had your art and your acting and y'all got together. But then, it looks to me like you guys have collaborated on a family business that is the book, uh, the first, yep. uh, the first book. So tell me, which I, which to me, that in and of itself, the fact that it's a project that that has both of your fingerprints all over it, it showcases your art, your right. talent, your humor. Um, that's so amazing. And talk to the listeners about your missing it and then what's to come. Okay, uh, so. My mom was an elementary school librarian, and she always wanted me to do a children's book. Um, I had, you know, Tiff and I had thought about children's book ideas for years, especially once we started having kids. But I never felt, and nor did my wife, that we had that, you know, that umph, like that idea, right? Like, <clears throat> and um, I remember. I was outside pushing Holt. He was about a year old. So this was about two and a half, three years ago. And uh, I was doing the one-handed push on the swing, yeah. looking at my phone with one hand, <laughs> pushing him with the other hand. You know, just what we unfortunately tend to do at yeah. times, which is just stare at a freaking electrical device 
uh, my wife opened the kitchen window, true story, and yelled at me, you're missing it. <laughs> and I was like, whoop, juggled my phone, <laughs> put it in my pocket. And I was like, <laughs> bing. I was like, oh my gosh, this could be, this could be a really good book. Uh-huh. So then my wife had a cookbook that she was writing at the time. And, um, I went into my studio. I kind of crafted the story very loosely, drew thumbnails. I mean, it was, it was so elementary, man. It was like, you know, when you're a kid and you make a book and you staple eight and a half by 11 uh-huh. sheets together, that was it. Yeah. And, uh, but the whole story was there from A to B. And, uh, and I gave it to Tiff and I, and I hadn't said anything about it. And I was like, what do you think of this? And she was like, Oh, I like this. It's cute. And I'm like, what do you think of that for a children's book? She goes, Oh yeah, that could be a great book. And I was like, give it to your lit agent. Cause I, at the time had no lit agent. She did literary agent, yep. um, for her cookbook. She was like, well, he doesn't really do children's books. It's more. And I was like, I get that. However, he's our only lit agent. <laughs> right. Let's just throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. So she sent it to him and he got back to us, I think in a day. And his response was, I don't do kids books, yeah. but I want this to be my first. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It felt awesome. And what else, what else felt awesome about it is that it only took a day because in the business that I'm yeah. in, it feels like everything takes forever. Yeah. So, uh, he was like, you guys sit tight. I'm going to go send it to a few public publication firms, uh, some publishers and we'll see if anybody bites, he called us back. I, I mean, relatively soon. And the reason I'm telling you this story is, is because it's amazing. And it is amazing because it's one of those examples where it, the, the, ball fell in my court, yeah. which again, in this industry doesn't happen all the time. Right. So he came back to us and he goes, you guys got a full on bidding war right now. Wow. This- yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I still even saying that doesn't feel like it really happened. It was, it was so awesome. Yeah. And then we went with uh, penguin random house and then that was the journey. So it took about two and a half years from the idea to the illustration, to writing, to holding it. And yeah. man, when I opened this thing, I smelled it. Yeah. I was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. it's real. But, uh, but yeah, that was the first thing that we, we've collaborated on book wise. Um, and we did, like I said earlier, we did the book tour together and that was just so much fun because, you know, when you have young kids, yeah, it was almost like a five day date, you yeah. know? We went around the country and did our thing. I don't know if you can hear my wife saying Maggie over and over. We rescued a Great Dane, and she's so big that she will <laughs> eat off, literally off the uh, table. Those so. things are, yeah, that, those things are like miniature horses. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you got chickens, a Great Dane. You just, you just fill it up the acre out there. Pretty. Yeah, it's a motley crew at best, but, uh, but yeah, that's it. You know, the the children's book came out April thirtieth. Um, it's, it's almost like you, like, like what we talked about again, I I keep going back to this, but you and I spoke about a week ago, but like your children, your girls are now in college. They've, they've moved out. You've raised them to the best of your ability. And now you're like, yeah, go forth. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Right. Right. And please, hopefully what I taught you registers and good choices, be your best self, all that. Right. Which I say to, my nine-year-old every morning when I take her to school, I'm like, be your best self. But the children's book, you know, it's like we put so much work into it and it's, it was, we were eat, sleeping and breathing it for so long. And then when it came out, it's just like, that's the only analogy I can think of. Yeah. You saying goodbye to your, your girls and them going to college yeah. where it's like, Hey, I, uh, yeah. hope everything's cool. Well, but it- Super satisfying having, having done it. Well, heck yeah. And the thing is too, Brady, I mean, you're talking about like the whole 2% of the SAG, um, artists actually, you know, being working actors publishing these days. And and this is, you know, from someone who self-published a couple of books. I mean, I I haven't even tried to, 
uh, to go with the the agent route or anything like that because literally now you it, back in the day you'd have to send a book in and hope it gets noticed and now unless you are you know a a list you know anchor or newscaster somewhat you're Jordan Peterson or or whomever you're not even going to look at it. I mean, publishing, right. publishing has become so competitive. So the fact that you guys put something out there that was immediately, it immediately resonated with somebody that's not even in the, that genre. And then to have the success it's had, man, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud Thanks. of you guys. That's a, that's an incredible feat in and of itself. So, Thank you. all right, man, I want to be mindful of the time because, and I'm going to love saying this to my listeners because You've got to go pick up kiddos, which is so awesome. See, people, see, these Hollywood folks, they're they are just like us, right? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I, I am my child's Uber driver. That is what I am. Well, I, 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 I lived that life for a while. At one time, we had uh, two girls at two different campuses in the same town, and um, it's, it's pretty uh, tricky. Of course, like I told you, now one's in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. One's in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, they're, so they're awesome. really far apart. But it goes fast, brother, so that's why I don't want to infringe on that time. Yeah. Enjoy every last minute of it. Thanks, Jason. This was a lot of fun, man. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it's been great. I mean, it was great talking to you last week. It was great talking to you again, and let's let's – Keep the train going, man. Well, brother, anything I can ever do to return the favor. And here, you can't see me. And just so the listener knows, my computer camera's messed up. So what I'm going to do, Brady, I'm going to take a selfie of us. And I'll sh- I'll text it to you. Let me see. Let me see. Where are you? Oh, yeah. There we go. All right. Smile. Perfect. All right. So there. That will uh, – and then I – so you know, you'll be one of the, the guests that actually has a real headshot for the uh, – for the bio on the website. So that'd be cool. I need a headshot and a bio brother. Oh boy. Yeah. I that. Um, yeah, I'll send you one. Wow. I'm great. Um, <clears throat> all right, Jason. It was fun catching up Brady. Thank so you much fun, so dude. much. I appreciate it. And the next time I'm out in LA, which, you know, like I said, my girls used to, we used to be at Disneyland at least, you know, every other year we loved it. I used to have to go out there on business quite a bit, but, uh, I'll find an excuse to get out there and I'd love to catch up and uh, do, break bread. reach out. David Washington, I, I keep throwing all these old uh, fraternity brother names, but he's coming out, I think, next week, and I haven't seen him in probably, oh my goodness, 15 years, man. Wow. Well, and you know what? The Lord works in mysterious ways. You know, I told you I've got this project, this film project I'm working on with Luke, so who knows, man? We may uh, end up, uh, you may have to, I may be calling you for advice. You may be my Yoda hey, brother. <laughs> I will uh, be your Yoda. All right. <laughs> Brady, thanks, right. man. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for taking me down memory lane, bud. This was you made me uh, think of a lot of things I haven't thought about in a long time. So good. Well, it was fun. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Later, brother. Later, bud. Bye, bye. Hey, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Texas Titans podcast. Before you go, I wanted to let you know where you can find us out there on the interwebs. You can go to show notes as well as listen to all the past episodes and look for upcoming. Uh, shows at texttitans.blog. Also, that has all the different formats that you can listen to the show on if you go there. So, texttitans.blog. You can also go to jasonrightnow.com. That has not only a link to the podcast, but it also has a link to my Make Your Own Rules blog that I think you'll enjoy. So, please check that out. Also, it has information about my executive coaching business, speaking, and anything else like that. So, Jason Wright now.com that's literally just my name jason right now.com on twitter i'm at jason right tx i would really appreciate a follow i have not been a big twitter user so i need you guys to help me with that so please uh take the time to go out to jason right tx find me and follow me i'm trying to get more active with it and so if you'll engage with me i'll try to do a better job of engaging with you so i would appreciate that and then on instagram i'd really appreciate a follow there i'm at jason right now again my name now so so please follow me on Instagram. And then on Facebook, I'm also at Jason Wright TX. So check us out there. I'm, and I'm also on LinkedIn, so look for me there. I try to use as many platforms as possible to let you know about upcoming shows, past shows, and then also just anything that I find interesting. I'm trying to push it out and get better with the social media. So please check us out out there and follow us. I would be most grateful. And also, please do not forget... 
it means the world to me for you to go to iTunes, give us a rating right now. We've got that five-star rating. I'm hoping to hold that. Please, please, please. The comments that people are writing are so very kind. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. And that's how we keep moving up in the ranks. And right now, we're crushing it with downloads. The show has really had incredible feedback thanks to you guys. So I'm grateful. Please keep that momentum going by giving us a, uh, a review on iTunes. Thanks so much, and have a great day. And as always, I could not be more grateful for you listening. Thanks.